Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Halt the Mode and today on Halt the Mode we are doing our Haute Couture review. Now yes, you're probably shocked, oh my god Luke, you say Halt the Mode but then you say Haute Couture and like well, listen, I'm a multifaceted human being. Today we are going to be covering all of the Haute Couture shows that are important to talk about all in one video. I did film them in different days because it's a lot to produce three videos in like one week. It's just a lot of pressure that Right now I just can't handle. So we're doing it all in one video. But before we get any further into the video, if you guys are looking for a channel that talks about fashion in the most fun, sassy, bitchy, analytical way, this is it. So please go down below, hit the subscribe button and turn on my post notifications. I mean like, what do you have to lose? You're already here. And if you guys wanna see more from me, you can follow me on any of my social medias linked down below. And you can check me out on my new podcast with my friend Darnell Jamal called The Fashion Victims Podcast, where we talk about all of the fashion news and gossip you need to know. So let's get into the reviews. Now, first up is Scaparelli. Daniel Roseberry debuted his second collection under the house of Scaparelli this season. And well, it was a bit blah. This season is spring, which many would interpret to be light and airy and meant to shed the harsh and dark times of winter, ice and snow. But Roseberry dropped the ball this season. Last season was all about him showcasing his vision for the brand. And considering the brand is the remnants of the surrealist fashion mastermind, Elsa Schiaparelli, there is a lot of pressure on Roseberry. Maybe it's a little bit too much pressure though. The opening looks, which are meant to be strong, in my opinion, was a black wide leg suit whose embroidery you couldn't really make out because it was done in all black. Looking up close, you could see a few S's and some eyes staring back at you. But regardless, it was a weak way to start the collection. And don't even get me started on the toilet paper top, which made the model look like she stuffed a literal roll down her pants and was letting it hang out like some sort of achievement. Listen, Beach, if that's your flu, the way you drape, well, figure out a new way to drape. The look that should have opened the show followed and was a nice little tailored suit whose lapel turned into a gigantic cloud of fabric that gracefully held the model's neck like a very fashionable neck pillow. Last season, Roseberry utilized this aesthetic for his finale dresses. And so it's nice to see it actually be explored in relation to a tailored look rather than a gigantic gown. Then we started to get into quite simple pieces which were terribly draped and pleated. I don't watch haute couture to see pieces that could easily be put in the Schiaparelli ready-to-wear lookbooks. I understand clients want to see wearable pieces, but wearable doesn't mean downright depressing. In my book, I wouldn't like to think so. A nice fitted strapless gown explored the same cloud style, thank God, which was also wrapped around the head in a beige color. Then came a simply draped dress with a sharp shoulder that was simple yet effective, even with a gold belt. While I couldn't grasp the reasoning for the pleated button-up and wide-leg pant look, I did fall in love with the beautifully fitted leather dress held together by gold rings. I mean, like, that neckline? Ugh. I mean, listen, if you're gonna do leather, do it right, and Daniel seemed to do that here. A sheath gown appeared with a low plunging neckline and two straps that twisted and twirled as the model strolled by. The straps stood at attention while one curled, the other stood taller, and I normally wouldn't necessarily approve of asymmetry. I think you've all watched the red carpet reviews by now. Here I assume it's being done to show clients there are multiple ways to wear these straps, which can be helpful for when they're making decisions for their purchases because if you didn't know, they don't just buy everything that comes off the runway, they make it their own because they are haute couture clients and they're low key what I would like to be in my life. Then a beaded sheer gown arrived covered in hanging jewelry dangling from the model, which was nice, but less than impressive. To me, the jewelry Roseberry shows is low hanging fruit. Hopefully it's a money maker for the company because listen, I'm all about everybody making their shmoney, but that doesn't mean it's of any real interest. Just Scaparelli made thought provoking pieces in collaboration with some of the greatest artists of the 1930s. And well, I's and S's aren't terribly thought provoking. They're actually quite trivial. Then came a dress that was a reference back to an iconic Scaparelli piece titled The Skeleton Dress, which was done by quilting and padding to create a skin tight dress that looked as if the wearer had their bones, spine, hip, you know, arms, back, ribs protruding through the dress. Here, Roseberry recreated where the original bones would have been 
but instead utilize jewelry to create the line work. And honestly, without the background knowledge, that would have been totally lost on me. Like it's a great reference, but honestly, it doesn't really say much except I can reference Elsa. And I can reference Elsa too. Let it go, let it go, turn away. I don't know how that sounds like, whatever. In reality, this isn't the point of the house of Scaparelli. It's great to reference the house, but to do so in a manner that shocks and confuses the viewer is more in line with Scaparelli. What isn't really Scaparelli is pandering to a clientele that doesn't seem to know what they actually want. I like the idea, but the execution falls way too flat. I will say the gold glasses were quite cool. Next was a blonde draped dress, but I was far more interested in the asymmetrical low rise pants. Then came a whole slew of shitty and boring looks I really don't care about. Neither should you. But we did get another reference to the skeleton dress, this time in black, but unfortunately it still isn't necessarily much better. Although the light blue jewels do have a more beautiful twinkle than the beige and gold. I don't know why people love beige and gold. The collection goes a bit blah again till we get to a high-waisted bandage gown with audacious ruffle straps, similar to the look that Beyonce wore to the Golden Globes this month. She was wearing custom Scaparelli. And while I do expect a lot more from both B and Rosebury, it is interesting to see how Scaparelli is unafraid to let famous clients debut its pieces before its runway does. Is this a smart business move? Honestly, I don't really know, but only time will tell. To be honest, I really couldn't be bothered with the big ball gowns or the printed suits as honestly, they're just fucking ugly. I mean, very few people are going to buy big ball gowns. But if you're gonna make them, at least make some that are instantly attractive because nobody needs to see an asymmetrical skirt on a bodice meant to be the height of fashion design and craftsmanship. Another leather dress was covered in jewels and gold rings, which was fine. And a cloud-like dress that reached over the head once again and created an asymmetrical high-low style was covered in the same jewels. The garments are fine but I also believe they were meant to be the wow looks from the collection and well, wow, that's all. I really cannot with the whole kid's parachute looks as it's gotten a bit tired, especially when you're wasting fabric to make such monstrosities. Think of the children. I will say I did love the sheer beaded mermaid gown as up close you can actually really see the beauty of the bead placement and how the color blocking creates a stunning effect on the way the dress is perceived by the viewer from a distance. As for the finale look, who needs those sleeves? Nobody, nobody. Except the children at your local school whose play parachute has mysteriously gone missing. Again, think of the children. All in all, while there was some nuance to the collection, it doesn't stand out on its own at all. Next up, let's talk about Iris Van Herpen. When you watch an Iris Van Herpen show, you might not always get it. Sometimes you might not even like it but you have to admire the amount of work that goes into the clothing, as well as how she has no problem letting her audience have access to the references behind the collection. The collection this season was called Sensory Seas and was meant to be an exploration of the scientist Santiago Ramon Cajal, who created revolutionary anatomical sketches of neurons while also referencing a little known organism called the Hydra, which are known to not actually age, making them immortal. The first look was a brilliant gown with a gorgeous pleated skirt and sleeves in black with sheer mesh to showcase the model's body. I can't find the technical term for the style of having the pleats slowly open up as you look down, but the black plisse pleats are truly elegant. And the leather laser cut off the shoulder yet halter bodice is sublime. Next is a black sheer mermaid gown with white curved lines trailing down the dress, illustrating the neck, bust, and waist. The shoulder cutouts are superb and the sleeves are to die for, creating an almost armor-like presence. The next look was rough though, and I was quite shocked to see a few of these styles throughout the collection as they are quite frankly, fucking ugly. The inverted box pleats with a black chiffon jumping out of each of the holes was disturbing to say the least and reminded me of like a scary eel. And the thing is, eels are like one of my favorite aquatic animals, so I don't want my eel references to be ruined by this ugly ass dress. Honestly, it looked like a bad Project Runway outfit, which is hard to say as somebody still a part of the IVH cult, cause like live long and prosper for the IVH cult. I mean, it's just fucking ugly. No getting around it. I don't have anything else to say about it. If you can't see it well, get your eyes checked, please. The next 
look was another halter look with the same line patterns 3D printed like earlier, except this dress flared out at the hips, creating an exaggerated silhouette. The next look was a sheer dress with 3D waves that had a shiny fabric tip, which created chaos as it descended down the dress. Again, it's just not a stupendous look in my opinion, as the sheer on the bodice is less than impressive. On top of that, while I understand the neurons are chaotic and create their own patterns in a reference to Santiago Ramon y Cajal, which could be a reason for most of the asymmetry throughout the collection, it doesn't mean that the style is well attractive. Next was an asymmetrical cape gown with an interesting print. I assume this is another reference back to the Santiago Ramon y Cajal illustrations, but it just ended up looking like a blow up python print filled with too much color. Next, a cocktail dress cut in circular shapes that were then layered on top of each other was a nice solid little moment. It's definitely familiar to those who enjoy IVH's work, and I think the color choice of mostly blue with dashes of purple make the organic tissue prints, which is what I'm going to call these, a little bit less offensive. Next was a gown made of Duchess silk and silk organza that channeled the movements of Ramoni Cajal's illustrations on the bodice, with disorderly silk organza pleated veins running and bashing into each other. It then falls into a fuller skirt with the organic tissue print, which again is just less than appetizing. A similar look emerged this time utilizing red and purple, which are signature Van Herpen colors, and felt a lot less ugly. Although I think that the pleated veins on the bodice, like the looks before, need to be less scary. I personally love the ethereal nature of Van Herpen's work, but this feels gross and nasty. And disturbing. And if that is what Iris was looking for, well, she most certainly got it. But that doesn't mean that it's pleasant to look at. The next look is another one of those tubular box pleats, and I continue to be disturbed. That goes without saying. It's just god awful, makes me want to die. A beautiful off the shoulder gown followed it though, in a force of colors like purple, black, red, and blue. And it seemed like a more commercial version of Van Herpen's signature colors, but it was nice nonetheless. I mean, listen, everybody needs to have a commercial piece now and again. I don't mind that. Next was a beautiful 3D printed dress that created a beautiful sleeve, fins to accentuate the hips, and what looked like a ribcage towards the bottom of the dress. It was signature Iris Van Herpen, but what made it so special was that the nude fabric actually matched the black model's skin tone, meaning the team's listening, which is all we can hope for for fashion brands. And it must not be that difficult to find nude netting for models, celebrities, and others wearing the gowns. The next was a cocktail dress in that same laser cut style, except the wing-like sleeves were superb. A gown followed in the same style. I am also truly in love with the cups of the dress, which remind me of two white cockatoos looking at each other with the crests on their head raised. I don't know, I'm just seeing a lot of animal parts in these dresses. Next was an oversized dress with a gorgeous laser cut leather bodice, which looked like it was being eaten by gigantic yellow leaves with veins exposed which could be another reference back to Ramoni Kajap. The skirts and sleeves are covered in these shards of fabric, and when the model puts her hands to the side, it really looks like it's a gigantic bubble dress. We get another one of the wave dresses, although this one is done in an okra color, again, not terribly impressive. Then we get another version of the Duchess silk and silk organza gown from before. This time there was a lot more of the printed Duchess silk, and the pleated silk organza worked as a light supplement to help give it an edge. It's more appealing here rather than the scary vein style. Now, I haven't watched any of the Star Wars movies, but I will be suing George Lucas personally if this does not make it on some strange alien queen in a future film. Like, this gown is phenomenal. It's beautiful. It's fucking stunning. And really lets the organic tissue print take center stage. And seeing as how it is such a powerful print, you really need to like let it stand alone without any of the gimmicks. Because this quite matronly silhouette is breathtaking even without the prints and could easily make clients want to purchase pieces from the brand. It's literally so gorgeous. It makes me so happy. I'm like, oh my God, I wish my veins exposed like that. Speaking of gorgeous, this insane look is stunning as well. And it looks like a beautiful bird in stark white. The layers and layers of white fabric just sit beautifully on the dress and move with the most incredible confidence. And the way it dips down in around the bust is stunning. And I'd love to see a gown version of it with a dramatic train. We get a gown version of the previous circular dress, but this version was much more extravagant and bubbly, but I'm not complaining about it. The finale look was a dramatic explosion of pink, 
purple and light blue fins jumping off the dress to create an almost floor length side flap extravaganza with a dramatic and layered bust. Here, the organic tissue print was perfect and the use of color allowed the piece to be even more dramatic. Overall, it's Iris Van Herpen. It's never going to be perfect, but she is the most revolutionary designer in the industry currently. No one explores textiles like her. No one utilizes revolutionary means of cutting garments like her. And no one can reference a dead Spanish scientist and microplanktons to form a coherent and fantastical fashion collection like her. And so for that, we stand as always. The show that we must discuss is Dior, and I really don't want to talk about it because I feel like I have better things to do, like bashing my head into a wall or letting myself get bitten by a poisonous insect. But alas, I must discuss another one of Maria Grazia's ready-to-wear collections. Oh, wait, it's fucking haute couture, but you never actually know it. This season, Maria Grazia on her never-ending quest to utilize feminist ideals as a substitute for her lackluster design skills tapped the artist Judy Chicago. Chicago's work, which I'm not entirely familiar with, is a colorful array of styles that seem great from the Google images I have seen. And yet somehow Maria Grazia fumbled the collection with great inspiration and referencing. The opening look is a hot mess of a fringe dress that looks like it was meant for the girlfriend of a gladiator. The cross straps over the bust are thick and ugly, and I'd love to see how this was meant to be worn for a woman with larger breasts. From there, it's a hodgepodge of shitty gold and bronze looks. Ugly pleated tops, more unbearable fringe, and the most audacious drape top and pencil skirt combo I think I've ever seen. And now, there are some styles that look like they could be nice, obviously for an older customer, which makes sense for a couture client. But that doesn't mean that the look should look like it was constructed by a four-year-old with a My First Sewing Kit set. The woman is so useless that she can't even get the jacket to fit properly because of course she had to add a belt. Always with the belts. The point of couture is that it is meant to fit the model and client exquisitely, as if it's a second skin. No offense, but having to belt your jacket so that it stays in place doesn't exactly read second skin to me. Take look six. The fabric looks cheap, shiny, stiff, and embossed with a high curved collar. That is actually kind of nice. Not the, the stuff I was just saying, but the curved collar. But the darts and seams of the jacket are so visible in haute couture. The look should be effortless, but it feels like stiff and cheap and mature, which no one, not even the old biddies buying old couture, want to feel. Listen, I get your, your, your designing for an older customer, but an older customer doesn't want to look like an older customer. And don't get me started on that monstrosity of a pleated skirt. I can't with the peplum top and the awful pan as if the haute couture customers are buying from Oshkosh Bagosh. There were tons of antiquity dresses meant to impress us with flowing chiffons, which happened once in a stunningly draped white gown. But for some reason, Maria Grazia and her team can't even continue making nice dresses like this because the next gown is an awful iridescent pleated gown with a sad excuse for a draped bodice with two braided strings creating a gigantic X across the bust. Listen, X marks the spot of where we should just rip the dress apart. And of course it fell into a braided belt. The vest coat looks awful with all the seams so visible and that seems to be like her design aesthetic, visible seams. It just truly hurts my eyes and the name of haute couture and the heritage of the most visible fashion house on the planet. I will say the sheer bodice is made of some sort of rope-like material was nice and should have been explored much further and definitely not just shortchanged as exclusively bodices. Another thing is Look 29 is a perfect example of her sloppiness, because that's the problem with all these collections. They just look sloppy. You can obviously see the bustier underneath the lopsided bra cups, which why would anybody on the planet want people to think that one of their breasts was visibly larger than the other? And then why would you want to make the bustier so visible, especially the boning, which takes the total fantasy out of the style? The ancient Greeks and Romans, who you're referencing, had to carefully drape and sculpt their clothes to get a desired outcome every single day. They didn't have some boned corset to help. It's just such a mishmash of shitty references. And we're more than one third of the way into the collection and all I've seen is the shiny bronze, gold, green, and white. If you're gonna use Judy Chicago as a reference point, maybe you could actually reference some of her colorful work? I don't know, is that difficult? I, please, 
I, don't, I just don't understand. A print of something, please. Cause looking at your poor old couture work is really getting tired. Like I'm sleepy, like, oh my God, Maria Grazia. Then she added a coat and maybe you would think you're getting a coat worth looking at, except it's literally a gold coat with floral embroidery. Wow, never seen anything like that before. There is another beautiful sheer bodice, this time with the face of a lion, but of course she must ruin it with a pleated layered skirt. Like why must you ruin everything sacred? Uh, especially the house of Dior. I guess I like this purple pleated people eater dress, I guess. Also, why would you want a simple dress with a draped bodice that then looks like one part of the dress went rogue and started to try and munch on your arm? I don't get it. Like who wants that? The bad draping of these chiffon dresses literally makes me feel like Maria Grazia is ripping my heart out. And like, it's just giving me that guy from Indiana Jones vibes where he like reaches his hand in that person's chest cavity and then just rips out the beating heart. Maria Grazia is that person. And honestly, like now she's gonna go watch Indiana Jones, be like, oh my God, look at this made up indigenous culture that I didn't know about. And then take it and make a whole collection based on cultural appropriation. Mark my words, mark my words. I'm skipping a bunch of the repetitive looks and only slightly acknowledging all of the pleated gowns and all the colors of the rainbow at the end. Cause like, you know, it's the same shit, different day. Like, God forbid, it just looks like a ready to wear collection, which it's a couture that's kind of really offensive to say. The finale gown was a blue and gold gradient gown with a gigantic circle in the center for God knows what pretentious ass reason with a sad fringe skirt and sheer cape. Maria Grazia Curie is delusional, uninspired, and downright disastrous. But apparently she's also making money for the brand as Dior's clothing has recently become an important part of the business but is selling Breton striped sweaters, entirely draped gowns, worth the lack of originality, talent, and taste? I don't know. Ask Monsieur Bernard Arnault. So we're moving on to Chanel. Virginie Viord's Chanel convent isn't really what anybody wanted or expected from the house's spring summer 2020 haute couture collection, but regardless, we got it. While Karl Lagerfeld dreamed up new worlds for the Chanel woman to explore, Virginie Viard likes to look back on the history of the house, which is why the show took place in a recreated garden of Coco Chanel's childhood home, the Abbey of Ubazine, which was an orphanage where she was raised by nuns. The collection wanted to take the elegance of haute couture and juxtapose it against the simplicity of the Abbey and the clothes Coco would have worn, which was usually white blouses and black skirts. And so that's the majority of the collection. It was simple, black and white, and it started off with a tweed dress. The looks were almost all accessorized by white tights, black heels, and chunky white socks. And I've later found out that in fact, the white socks are attached to the black heels, so like it's a combo deal. So yeah, good luck with that. To be honest, I audibly laughed when I saw the socks because they are truly so fucking ugly. Vogue even mentioned that Carl didn't like those things, which means that even against Viard's better judgment, AKA the soul of Carl, who edited her work in the ateliers when he was still alive, she still persisted with such awful styling that it ruined any chance the collection had to be beautiful. Many of the looks showcased a range of collared styles, from small and petite ones to quite dramatic and large over the top ones covered in embroideries. Maybe for clients, it's fun to mix and match their collars to their couture, but for the rest of us, well, it's really fucking boring to say the least. I also actually couldn't believe that Virginie had covered not one, but nine skirts in this awful tool, as if it was meant to look attractive. Like why cover up perfectly good skirts with a thin layer of tulle and then think it would look good and designed well for some reason? Make it make sense for Ginny, make it make sense. I didn't mind this quite big plaid dress with embroidery above the bust line and at the hip. And FYI, doesn't mind does not equate to actually liking something. It just means it was the least offensive thing I've seen so far. The hemlines are so low on many of the looks, which does not read modern at all. One look that was quite flawless though, and something that Virginie consistently does well are these long trim gowns that feel quite casual, but the length makes them quite breathtaking. Here it's in a diagonal plaid, belted, and with a wrap halter that creates a turtleneck of sorts. Virginie here feels strong, like she has a new Chanel woman who is quiet, demure, and somewhat severe, which can be chic. 
If only the rest of the collection actually matched that attitude, we might have something to work with. Look 13 was a ball gown style dress with a shawl that forms at the shoulders and reaches down to the knees in the back and has that quite provincial vibe. I almost threw up at the next look though, which is gigantic tweed wide leg pants, which I can't tell if that's like a big seller for the haute couture customers, but the gigantic collar was not helpful at all. It just looks so odd and like a badly done copy and paste mistake. Like somebody was doing their Photoshop editing and then oop, left that right there. Oh God, we forgot it and we sent it straight to the printer. While one Breton striped dress in pink was ghastly, the long blue and white version was actually similar, but much more stunning. Normally the looseness of Viard's garments annoy me to no end, but here it's quite beautiful. For those that don't know, Breton is a French classic, first worn by French seamen in 1858. And I mean, who doesn't love a little bit of semen? And then to have remnants of semen on a Chanel haute couture gown, sounds delicious. Another style that was also confusing to me and something Karl Lagerfeld also did, so I'm not gonna like put the total lame on Virginia here, was this gown where the belt sat right above the hips and the fabric of the top of the dress hangs over like a little pouch. And now I understand maybe that could be helpful for those that don't wanna draw attention to their stomachs or want to hide it under their beautiful haute couture, but it's just downright ugly. Like there, it doesn't, it doesn't help. It, it just hinders. Then we got three nice little tweed skirt suits. The first two had quite boxy jackets and a nice little A-line skirt. And the third had a beautiful long jacket that was invisibly buttoned at the top and showed the model's bare torso. In reality, a very severe yet beautiful jacket, which I'm kind of obsessed with, but it's ruined by the awful skirt that then is made even worse by the tulle layered over it. To me, Virginie's work could be very mute and simple and clean and crisp and minimal, and that could be her aesthetic and that could be great. But when she ruins pieces with shitty little fashion gimmicks like a tulle overlay, it confuses me to no end. I just don't get it. I don't understand. What's the point? The same glass looks, which I can only assume are a reference back to Aubazine, are in these boring pastels and even the prints are lifeless. One prairie dress was gorgeous and then actually made me think about how the designer Simone Rocha would be fantastic at Chanel if she was ever appointed the creative director. Kaya Gerber wore this little ball gown dress with black tulle shawl built into it. And again, it's just such a confusing thing to do to a seemingly simple yet beautiful dress. I can't speak on the ruffle vest belted over a ruffle dress. I will say though, I'm sure Carl is rolling so rapidly in his grave that that must be the reason why the tectonic plates are creating earthquakes in California. I loved one little crop jacket and ruffle dress in cream, but it gave me Parenza Schooler vibes, but I'm not saying that Parenza Schooler should do Chanel because that would actually be heresy. There was awfully pleated gowns, sheer overlays and hurtful ball gowns with basic rich florals that I'm just like not even gonna like get into because they sucked. I did love that little caped ball gown with the pink embroidered lace and the little floral sequins at the hem. She can stay, I'm about her. There was a beautiful lace dress that actually utilized white tulle as a barrier between the viewer and the lace which was sweet as it was also done on the sleeves. And then the scalloped off the shoulder neckline was helpful too. Another striped dress with subtle panels of sheer was stunning as well and played to that serenity that I like about Virginie's work. The next three gowns in black and white were whatever. And when I compare them to the final looks from Carl's last haute couture collection, it's so obvious to see we are missing the wit and whimsy of Chanel. It just has no heart. It has no soul. It has nothing to say except Look at me, I'm crisp and I'm clean and that's all I am. The finale look, I truly cannot even talk about, but I will say Virginie was quoted as saying the length of the dress, which is meant to be a wedding dress, like most final looks from haute couture shows, was trying to be modern. She needs a dictionary ASAP if she thinks that that monstrosity is modern. All in all, the rumors about Phoebe Philo taking over the helm of Chanel is the only thing giving me hope for the brand in these very, 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 trying times, because Virginie Viard is trying it. Let's move on to Givenchy. Claire White Keller's Givenchy is a miracle and jaw-dropping, and at one point almost had me in tears, and like, you know me, I, 
tears, I'm an Aquarius, doesn't exist. But it's hard not to see the true difference between her truly god awful ready to wear and the beauty that is her haute couture. If only she could be the sole proprietor of the haute couture line and find a new and young name to dedicate the time to the ready to wear. Or better yet, dissolve the ready to wear line and stick exclusively to haute couture, as that's what the founder, Hubert de Givenchy, envisioned the house to originally be. But I digress. Claire White Keller's reference for this season was Virginia Woolf, who inspired her to showcase a love letter of sorts to the house's founder, Hubert. Hubert was revolutionary for his time. In the early 1950s, as he created a wardrobe of separates that revolutionized how women dressed, he made shmoney from his line, which was hard to do at that time during couture, as many big houses were shuttering or losing a lot of money. Claire opened the show with a big white wide leg pantsuit, which was a bit blah for me. The tailoring of the jacket on top though was superb, as it's crisp and it's clean and it fits the model perfectly, and I don't even mind the subtle white belt, but the silk pants are just lost on me. Ada Akech stormed the runway in a beautiful black and white ruffle top. Next was an orange ruffle top and peach skirt combo. That was a bit audacious, but I didn't totally mind it. It's nice to see a bit of controlled exaggeration on the runway, and I will say the maroon belt was a great way to focus on the waist. Normally, you know I hate a belt, but here, Claire smartly uses the belt as the sculpting principle for the waist, instead of using fabric. It also makes the wearer's waist look absolutely non-existent, which could be a cute modern form of corsetry. We get some ruffled gowns, one in the same black and white pattern as before, and another in all white, but the most amazing is the blue version. The gingham of sorts has multiple shades of blue playing together to create an amazing effect. The actual dress fades from a light blue to a very dark blue as you move down, but the ridiculous ruffles attached do the same color gradation as the dress which creates this beautiful ombre effect and like this sort of deeper depth of focus. Again, her tailoring is impeccable and this black suit is a great example. The sleeve is striped with a white feather sort of material that bops along as the model walks. Claire absolutely murders sleeves in like a hot, sexy way, not like a gross, scary way. And this look is no different. The next two white and yellow strapless gowns are okay and could easily be customized to fit a client's color needs. And even without the yellow, they can actually make gorgeous wedding dresses, which I'm sure is a big business for the couture side of the house. The cape with a hanging sleeve, which is the name of the sleeve that has that little slit in it where the arm pops out, wasn't my favorite as the floral fabric pieces that are attached never really look good in my opinion, but I didn't mind the feather collar. The next two looks are both beautiful in silhouette and material, but the floral prints again just read old dead British granny whose curtains got donated to the charity shop after her funeral and Claire White Keller found them and loved them and said, make it into a dress. It's just an unpleasant print. No getting around it. I'm just really sorry. The big hats on the models though, I loved. Something about Claire's couture that is great is she constantly develops amazing accessories like the couture backpacks from a few seasons ago. And this season we had these amazing, ridiculous, oversized tool hats that Jacques Mousse would be so mad about. Stay mad, Simone. The blue balloon dress is fire. The color is beautiful, the jacquard fabric's texture is chic up close, and for some reason, although it is ugly, the balloon dress over the ruffle skirt amazes me. We get an exploded beauty guru palette ruffle dress, which I was less than amused about, and the white yellow dress again was a bit blah. But I will say that little 60s bateau neckline dress in white is ethereal. And the feathers dripping down from below the hem are dreamy too. The silver and white looks were just a bit meh for me. I get maybe it's popular, but it does give me bad looks from the monosex machina Met Gala red carpet vibes. And like Claire White Keller, you're better than making Judy Jetson hook a wardrobes. And the tool and lace dresses that were all crazy and asymmetrical were a bit whatever as well. Although the white version was nice, I'll take her. But the black sheer top and the pink skirt was an abomination. Abomination. Again, I really do love these gigantic belts. I think they're very, very chic, mostly because I think they're so thick and it's especially chic on this peachy circular neckline train top and pant combo. A train does not always have to be related to a dress, people. Understand that. 
The tailored coat and mermaid skirt was beautiful, but if the jacket hem was raised just a few centimeters, I think I would have liked it even more. And the black and white looks that followed were fine, but the black sheer gown with the white pearl stripes was stunning. My eyes are gonna roll out of my head, it's so good. I didn't love the neckline, but the fact that it has these billowy sleeves made it even better. A beautiful white jacquard bodice and big black silk skirt with train was extraordinary, but Kaya Gerber as the Givenchy bride really took the wedding cake. The off-the-shoulder dress in that lace is superb, and though while I didn't love it in coat form, the fact that they have that oversized hat matches it fantastically. To me, it almost frames Kaya like an all-white halo in a painting of the Virgin Mary. It's just really beautiful to watch. Claire killed it this season, and I'm happy to see it. Now, let's just get the ready-to-wear on track or get rid of it because it's ruining her legacy. Now, unfortunately, I am going to be skipping two shows this season. I'm really sorry. Don't hate me. It's Margiela and Guope. There was not time to actually watch high quality videos of the show. So I just didn't feel like I could really, really, truly review it. So Margiela and Guope teams, get on that HD video lifestyle, please. But let's move on to Valentino. Pier Paolo Piccioli is a mastermind. That goes without saying, you already know that if you've watched this channel before. His old couture shows are something we look forward to every season and his color blocking is legendary. This season, he wanted to explore clothing freely in a dreamlike state, but also pull the curtain back just a little bit on the craftsmanship of haute couture. Pier Paolo also mentioned he doesn't believe he's necessarily a storyteller when it comes to each season. And honestly, I agree. And when you can make beautiful fucking clothing that makes me drool, you don't really have to be a storyteller. He opened the show with a mermaid gown, which had a transparent bustier, which was covered by a pink sheer balloon top and accentuated with red opera gloves. The first look was tight, as in it actually fit the body, where lots of Pier Paolo's previous collections were very baggy and full of volume. Next was a powder blue tailored coat, which fully showcased a white, red, and black dress. It's so strange to see Pier Paolo do tight clothing, and I'm kind of even shocked to see breast cups on a dress, but honestly, I like it from him. It's more severe, and I can't really get over how good the feather earrings are either. Like, I, I need a pair. Imagine me with like big ass feather earrings. Then a mishmash of prints and textures came with a trumpet skirt that had white waves piped by silver sequins on it, which was topped by a sheer floral top, except the florals were blown up to create little squares and triangles to see through the shirt. And it was kind of giving Paco Rabanne like chainmail vibes. And then you mix that with the red and white shiny cape and it's a regular look from a Dr. Seuss book. And I love that for them. A pant and shirt combo was much tighter with an 80s flare as the sleeves of the shirt had a ruffle stripe, the waist was sashed with a red ribbon, and the purple low-key harem pants delighted me. Normally it's something we see a lot from Valentino, but it really is quite a fitted silhouette for Pier Paolo, which we again don't really see from his couture. A leather bow skirt is very reminiscent of the bow look from the Valentino Beijing Haute Couture collection, and I really didn't mind the goldfish printed cape either. Next was a shirt and skirt set with beautiful waves of green, almost like a painting, which is funny because Pier Paolo referenced Carl Jung, who was a Swiss psychiatrist who influenced painters like Jackson Pollock. So like maybe there was a reference back to painting. There was a beautiful purple gown with a low plunging U neckline. It was really draped around the neckline, but there were some asymmetrical godets at the bottom of the dress that are very interesting. I wouldn't say they're necessarily bad, but I wonder why they would be so asymmetrical. And it's something that we saw at Scaparelli as previously mentioned. So I don't know, maybe it's a trend in haute couture that I don't know about. Also the lilac opera gloves. Oy vey, beautiful, gorgeous, I'm stunned, I'm dying, I'm obsessed, I need to be buried in them. I dyed over the frill top with a black ribbon sash and a matching pant with bows. It's haute couture, fabric colors should be perfectly matched, and the simplicity of the red with the black accentuating it makes it even more striking. There were a few looks that were a bit weird though, like that polka dot look, and the full paillette and crystal encrusted trench coat look was really, really aggressive to say the very least. There was a sexy red shrug, which is a cropped cardigan on top of a lilac strapless top and black skirt. And honestly, it was fucking stunningly simple. Pier Paolo is literally fashion's king of color. It then started to get a bit wacky again from simple dresses with ridiculous ruffles lining the dresses slit 
to a shiny pink blazer layered over a long sheer polka dot top over a pantsuit to a black skirt with beige ruffles eating at the top. And about the last look, I do think that those earrings look similar to breasts due to their placement and I really love it. So that was saving grace in that moment. But the look that got me back on track was a lilac coat with a red turtleneck and lilac mermaid skirt. And I'm back in love, like it's easy. The weird thing about Valentino is there is this really weird shit that's like insanely styled, which makes me so angry. And then I get really unmad because the next look after it is so fucking beautiful. So I just like, forget it. Obsessed with the purple stole, but not the entire look. And then we started to get these beautiful fitted gowns. One in purple has this insane backless moment. And then a black and white pussy bow blouse dress, which is very Valentino, appeared and dazzled me. Maria Carlo Boscano showed up and turned out in an electric blue sequin trumpet gown. And I literally couldn't breathe for like five seconds. I literally felt like I was turning the same color as the gown. I normally hate sequins because they're done very tackily for the most part, but between the silhouette, which was stunning, and that electric blue that I really can't get over, I didn't even care about the sequins. Then there are a bunch of looks that are kind of whatever, but a red sheer cape and velvet skirt gown appeared, and the model was wearing a ridiculous bright red coral headpiece, and like what else am I supposed to say except thank you, Pier Paolo? Then we got a bunch of fitted gowns, many of which were backless, which to me is Pier Paolo saying, you beach is what we backless. I don't know, that was like Transylvanian accent, not Italian apologies to Pier Paolo and the entire country of Italy. We did get an almost sheer caged bustier look, which was weirdly reminiscent of Maria Grazia's Dior, but luckily Pier Paolo had his seafoam green silk at the top of the dress and at the hem, so I actually really enjoyed it. And the coral headpiece really doesn't hurt. And if I don't see one of those coral headpieces at the Met Gala, I'm going to literally, I don't even know. I'm just gonna be very disdained. This silver bust and black pleated skirt gown with a slit was yikes. A beautiful red turtleneck appeared and I fell in love. And then I fell in love again when the model turned around and I saw it was another backless dress. Lots of stripes, prints, and colors in usual Valentino fashion followed. And then I love this fitted pink sequin gown. There was a strapless black gown with a blue sash with a neckline. And I even loved a crystallized ruffle gown too. Only Pier Paolo can make me love things I normally would despise. There were more fitted gowns with bows, ruffles, and dramatic opera gloves. And then there was the most beautiful hooded gown in purple with a red sash, which was stunning. And I'm gonna cry if it ever makes it on a red carpet. Like I'm just gonna cry tears of joy and that will be my review. But the piece de resistance was out of a catch, closing the show in a pink gown exploding with feathers from the bust. It was haute couture at its finest. Your Paolo is a favorite. And the thing is, I don't have to love every look from the collection to really appreciate the collection. And I really applaud his experimentation cause it doesn't always work, but there's always great work to back it up. And finally, let's talk about Jean-Paul Gaultier. I'll be honest, I'm not a JPG head at all. That doesn't mean I dislike Jean-Paul Gaultier, I just haven't had the time to understand the beauty of it and its history. So when it was announced last week that Jean-Paul Gaultier would be stepping down from designing for the brand on the 50th anniversary, well, everybody was sad to hear it. So instead of doing a review, I'm just going to highlight some of my personal favorite moments from the show, cause it was a show. I mean, Issa Lish opening the show after walking out of a coffin carried by dancers was spectacular and a great way to start it. It was an 172 look collection. That was an open casting, meaning anybody could apply to model, which was great a Jean-Paul Gaultier because he is all about making clothing for anyone and everyone. And he always wanted to explore fashion outside of the norm of the industry standard. We get a glove covered dress and then we get a slew of tops with straps that laid on top of the model's skin instead of actually wearing them. So it was like blazers that they weren't actually wearing. It was like they were just on top of their bodies. I don't know, it was really interesting and strange and like conceptual fashion. An apron and cat suit was made of ties and a beautiful floral crinoline dress with all embroidery hoops filled with beautiful florals appeared. I was insanely impressed. There were a bunch of ridiculous lingerie inspired pieces from multiple layers of girdles layered on top of each other to Dita Von Teese in an off the shoulder strapped corset dress. But we got cut out motorcycle jackets as well, a look very reminiscent of a clockwork orange and a bit of a cocky sleeve. It dead ass looked like there was a cock on that man's sleeve. Naturally, you had a lot of Breton stripe looks, which was a Gautier signature. 
He loved taking the French national treasure and fucking with it. Gigi Hadid in a sheer triangle top and low rise wide leg pant was chic and the sailor hat didn't hurt either. The most beautiful pair of striped tights, a ruffle top, and there were bodysuits in that Breton stripe too. Carly Claus emerged in a full lace cat suit and TBH, no offense to Carly, but you look like such a Karen sometimes. It's just the truth. There were lots of denim caged looks and one really hot sheer bustier. There was a beautiful, almost fully sheer dress with a gigantic spiral skirt. The top of the dress could have been a reference back to Gautier's iconic tattoo shirts that made the wearer appear to have tattoos all over their body when slipped on. Lots of interesting takes on the suit and even a few nods to JPG's most iconic piece, the cone bra. I personally loved the bionic six pack. Eat your heart out, Tom Ford. There was a great off the shoulder beaded number layered over a jumpsuit. And now I'm going to have to try that. And that's the great thing about Gautier is that like, she just doesn't care. So things that people would say are never going to actually look good, then look good from Gautier. And you're like, okay, so life is possible, great. There was a beautiful houndstooth cutout circle coat with matching balaclava and bodysuit, and then bright colors and florals followed, as well as detailed prints. A nude illusion bodysuit with a Gautier waist belt was also striking. The collection then got a little bit more haute couture-esque with caged dresses and crinolines over nude bodysuits and a blow up latex bodysuit and skirt with matching balloon cone bra obviously. Lots of tulle, feathers, leathers, and fringe. There were also beautifully wispy chiffon gowns and two pairs of faded jeans on two older models that closed out the show. In reality, it was a stunning affair of fashion and changing the codes of dressing at its finest. I don't have to understand the whole collection to appreciate the fact that Jean-Paul Gaultier has changed fashion forever. But with the rumors swirling that Simone Port Jacques Mousse We'll be taking over the Jean-Paul Gaultier line. It'll be interesting to see what happens. But let's be real. SPJ does not have the same ring as JPG. That does it. So that is the end of our Haute Couture reviews. I hope you guys enjoyed. I'd love to know what you guys think in the comments down below. I will see you guys on the next video and TTYL.